Hello, Professor Ahmed. Hello. Hello. Few seconds to start. Yeah, just yes. one. Yeah. We are waiting for Mr. Hisham. Inshallah, Professor Mohammed Al Ashab, our head of the department, will start the day and introduce us. Okay. Professor Hisham has just joined, Mr. Hisham. Mr. Hisham. Hello, sir. May we start, sir? Thank you so much. Uh, it's a great pleasure and great honor for me and all my department staff to announce the beginning of the third day of uh, Banha Deformity Planning Online course and LRS course arranged on Zoom by the uh, Banha Orthopedic Department and the Deformity Planning Unit of the Banha Orthopedic Department. First of all, I would like to thank all our international guest speakers from UK and also all our uh, speakers from the uh, Banha Orthopedic Department. Also, I would like to thank all the our attendants from all over the camp, from countries all over the world. Thank, thank you uh, very much. And now we will start with the uh, talk of uh, Mr. Hisham Shalabi from Edinburgh. May you start, sir? Thank you so much. Can you can you hear me and can you see my yes. slides? Yes. yes. Quite thank you so much. So um, um, first of all, thank you so much for. Uh, this invitation, I would like to uh, really thank Professor Gamal Hosni and the uh, great faculty of, uh, of the Banha uh, course for this very kind invitation. It's a real pleasure to be here uh, today with you. Now, this talk is about the applications of the circular and the Lizarro frame in the foot and ankle. And the objectives of this talk is really to discuss the different applications in the foot and ankle and when is the frame suitable? And when also is the frame not suitable? And I can really start by giving you the key message of this talk really at the very beginning. It is very important that you focus on the pathology more than the deformity. So it is not the most important thing that there is 30 degrees of Aquinas deformity. The most important thing is why is there 30 degrees of Aquinas deformity? Why did it happen? Because this will allow you to treat proper. The foot and ankle uh, is one of the most complex applications of the frame. And the reason here is that there is a complex anatomy. There, the frames in general are much more complex and more difficult to deal with. But the key thing is that there is a vast spectrum of pathologies that cause deformities in the foot and ankle. And we can see here some of these applications. We can see applications in trauma, in infection, in lengthening, non-unions, congenital deformities, neuromuscular, tumor reconstructions, and in arthritis. But even these categories, each category has a vast spectrum underneath it as well. So even the congenital, for example, if you're dealing with a talipus patient, is different from dealing with an arthrogryposis patient or dealing with a hemimelia patient. Each category needs its own treatment depending on the exact pathology in that particular condition. So we will start with some applications. One of the commonest applications of frames is, are the applications in trauma. And the applicable cases here are cases where the fractures have a bony or soft tissue component or a local biology that makes it unsuitable for internal fixation. So a classic example here are the open comminuted pylon fractures. Now, again, remember that the frame is only a tool. So the treatment here should focus on treating the patient. You start with the ATLS principles and management of polytrauma patients. The frame as an operation is a complex one and we shouldn't be offering this to the patient acutely in the acute setup, particularly if they are a polytrauma patient. So you should always start with a bridging external fixator, allowing soft tissues to settle down and to recover, and allowing yourself to do proper imaging and to plan properly the type of treatment that you will execute with the frame. Remember here that the soft tissues are normal. And because they are normal and there is no much muscle imbalance, you can actually achieve acute correction here using the principles of ligamentotaxis, and this allow you to restore most of the fracture fragments. 
And then you need to do the indirect reductions of the dye punch fragments and the other fragments that have no soft tissue attachment. And then you use your frame for neutralization. And once the healing of the fracture starts, you can dynamize the frame and start early mobilization. Another application is the applications in infection and the non-union. And quite often, these two conditions go hand in hand. And one of the commonest uh, presentations here are infected non-unions of the ankle fusions, for example. So you can see here, patient had an ankle fusion, got an infection, and went into a non-union. And there is a mild deformity as well concomitant. Now, again, the treatment here is to treat the pathology. And you need to execute an extensive debridement to debride all the dead tissues and all the unviable tissues. You must take multiple tissue samples for microbiology and identify a bug appropriately and use the frame for a stable fixation. You can then use the frame to do acute or gradual compression. And in these cases, you should consider proximal corticotomies as well, because that will allow you to increase the circulation and will also allow you to correct any concomitant leg length discrepancy. And you can see that with these techniques, you can usually achieve good healing and consolidation of these non-unions and avoid problems of internal fixation. Another application are congenital cases. And as I explained, these are a vast uh, pathologies as well, the most common of which are cases of calipers. But there are other conditions, things like arthrogryposis, for example, where you have a lot of fighting to do with the soft tissues. The soft tissues are extremely tight. There are other conditions like congenital vertical talus. The tibial hemimelias and the fibular hemimelias are a category of their own, and they have their own anatomy and pathology that need to be addressed properly. In congenital cases, remember that the soft tissues and the bone are short. So you have to appreciate that these will create a lot of resistance to your correction. Sometimes there are significant deformities in these as well, and sometimes there are, uh, th but there is no muscle imbalance here. An example here of uh, a congenital equino uh, cavo varus, and the key uh, osteotomy that I personally use for these is the V osteotomy. The V osteotomy is a very versatile osteotomy. It allows isolation of the foot into three segments, the leg and the ankle, together with the heel as a second segment and the forefoot as a, as a third segment. And it gives you true versatility to correct the deformity. So I started by doing these osteotomies through the extensive Ollier approach. And I very soon moved to doing them percutaneously under X-ray uh, guidance. But nowadays, minimally invasive surgery in changed the practice in foot and ankle completely. So now we do a lot of the osteotomies in the foot uh, minimally invasive. The advantage of minimally invasive is that the burr takes away two to three millimeters of bone. And this gives you a lot of mobility and allow you to correct acutely some of the elements of the deformity. So for example, mild uh, aspects of translation and some aspects of rotation can be corrected acutely. This helps a lot in shortening the time in the frame. And now, the applications of these minimally invisible osteotomies are all over the foot, and we have to use all of these combinations when we are using the frames as well, like, for example, correcting toe deformities or forefoot deformities as well. So here, this is the same patient, 17 weeks in the frame. And the beauty about the frame here is that it can allow you to fine tune the correction to correct all the elements of the deformity, and the most importantly, allow you to restore the foot length, which is not something that you can do with acute corrections with parsectomies and so on. Here you can restore the length of the foot. And this is very, very good cosmetically and functionally. The next category are neuromuscular conditions. And again, you have a wide spectrum, polio, cerebral palsy, charcot uh, disease. Remember here that some of them are static conditions like polio. Some of them are progressive conditions like CMT. And remember here that you can have spastic muscles like cerebral palsy, and you can have also contractures. There, sometimes the deformities are quite significant, but the most important part is there is a significant muscle imbalance. You must correct the muscle imbalance. So this is a classic cavoverus deformity. 
uh, and you can again see that the frame can allow you to fine tune the correction and restore the length of the foot and correct all the elements of the deformity. Now, one of the stigmas of the frames in the foot and ankle is that the frames correct the deformity, but the foot is very stiff and it doesn't move a lot. This is a myth, that's not true. The foot becomes stiff if you crush the joints. And therefore, it is very important that you respect individual joints and distract them when you are doing your correction so that you can preserve or even restore some of the function of these joints, which helps overall in the overall function. So for the neuromuscular cases, you need to remember that these patients will be in the frame for about six months. You might lose one mobility grade and they sometimes might not recover this weakness if it happens. And there is a high instance of recurrence because of the muscle imbalance. So it is very important that you choose the patients correctly. These patients, you need to choose the patients who are still strong. Don't choose the patients who are just walking because they might have a corrected foot, but they might be very weak and they cannot walk anymore independently. You must correct the muscle imbalance and you need also sometimes to overcorrect to prevent recurrence and you need to protect these cases with bracing and orthosis afterwards. Reconstruction after tumors or big uh, bony defects. Uh, this is again another indication. This is something that we published in the JBCS back in 2006, a small series of uh, reconstruction following osteosarcomas of the distal tibia with frames and vascularized fibular grafts. Again, remember, this is a very complex treatment. This is one of many treatment or reconstruction modalities. So there are other treatment modalities that need to be addressed or can be used like endoprosthesis or like amputations and so on. And remember that this is a very complex treatment. You need a team. You need a team of a tumor surgeon that can do the extensive uh, dissections and the reconstructions and a vascular surgeon and a limb reconstruction surgeon to do the frames. Um, arthritis is the last indication that I will touch on, and it is one that I personally have a great interest in. And uh, this is here arthritis of the ankle in young adults. In Edinburgh, we offer ankle distraction for severe ankle arthritis to patients who are 45 years of age or younger who have a kellgren lawrence grade four, severe osteoarthritis of the ankle, who have no malalignment and who have failed conservative treatment and who had a previous arthroscopy. So here, for example, this uh, female patient is 23 years old, bimalular fracture, and she had internal fixation and then later the removal of the internal fixation. She's in a lot of pain because of the arthritis and she had two arthroscopies. She doesn't want to have a fusion and she is too young to have an ankle replacement. So here we distract the ankle joint and we lengthen the posterior structures during this distraction. And in the third stage of this protocol, we dynamize the frame during distraction. And the results are really, really impressive in correct patients. So here you can see five years following the frame removal, the joint space improved significantly. And again, five years, a lateral view, you can see a significant improvement in the joint space. But more importantly, this patient is back running and back exercising at a high level. And you can see also the improvement in the range of movement of the ankle joint as well. Another example of a similar case, 32 years old with a bimalular fracture of the ankle and severe arthritis, had arthroscopies and had all the conservative treatment he doesn't want to have a fusion. And at the same time, he's too young to have an ankle replacement. And you can see again here the distraction. And here you can see uh, his x-rays preoperatively, just after removal of the frame, one year and five years down the line with an impressive improvement in the range of uh, joint space, radiological joint space. And functionally, he becomes able again to function at a significantly higher level. These uh, distractions have a 90% reported improvement in pain. Survivorship in our series, in my series, is 6, 70 to 80% at five years, and 75% improvement in the range of movement, with a 50% at least significant improvement in the radiological joint space. 
So the take home message uh, from this talk is the foot and ankle applications of the frames are really quite vast. Uh, they are very too big really for us to uh, collectively speak about in, in a 10 minute talk. But it is very important that you select the patients wisely. And it is very important that you combine acute and the gradual corrections to minimize the time of the frame. And keep in mind that the frame is only a tool and you have to understand that and use it with the other available tools like internal fixation when you can or even amputation. Although I know amputation is not greatly appreciated in Egypt, but it needs to be addressed, particularly if you have significant infection and massive bone loss and very poor soft tissues. Also, you have to respect individual joints and don't crush these joints and even distract them if you can, because you can preserve and they can restore range of movement. You have also to counsel your patients very, very appropriately and thoroughly, because this is a very complex treatment. The frame is on the foot for a long period of time, and you need to have a patient that is cooperative, that will help you, and that will be able to take on any extra treatments needed. And finally, for those who are starting these techniques, don't be shy to refer the more complex cases to the more senior colleagues who have done more of these cases. Thank you. Thanks so much, uh, Mr. Hisham Shalbi, for this uh, wonderful and collective talk. It's a uh, um, it's pretty good one because it's uh, we we look after the holistic approach of doing things. So this talk is uh, just giving point here and there how to, uh, what's the best case that you can use a But of course, lizard application foot and ankle is just, it's, it's, a, it's a textbook, cannot be given uh, in, in, in 15 minutes, but you have did it wonderful. Uh, Prof. Alam, would you like to match the questions? We have a couple of questions here. We can take this. Uh, uh, you can do so. I am listening to you. That's fine. So uh, uh, one question uh, from the attendees, for how long do you keep the frame in case of uh, osteoarthritis? So the, the ankle distraction, the frame is on for three months. And during those three months, you do the distraction, which uh, is practically reaching eight millimeters of distraction. And you can usually achieve that within a couple of weeks. This is the first stage. The second stage is dorsiflexion. We lengthen the posterior structures and I personally use a constrained hinged frame for this purpose. And this allow lengthening of the posterior structures because the posterior structures, the tight posterior structures change the dynamics of the ankle and increase the joint reaction forces at the front of the joint. And after the second stage, when you reach a good 20 degrees of dorsiflexion, you dynamize the frame. So when we dynamize the frame, the, frame, the patient moves the, the, the ankle during the distraction for a couple of weeks, and then we remove the frame. This is different from the most of the published results of the distraction, which uses either a TSF frame or a static uh, distraction frame. And uh, I'm in the process of uh, publishing this three-stage protocol. Thanks so much. I think uh, that answered the second question, which is hinged or fixed frame for distraction. I think you, you have already answered this. Um, another question, what's the rate of daily distraction in ankle osteoarthritis? So in ankle uh, osteoarthritis, you can tailor the distraction according to the patient because you're not fighting with any bone healing or osteotomies. So what I personally do is I allow the patient a week after the operation doing practically nothing, allowing them to get around with the frame. And then they start to distracting at one millimeter per day. And some patients initially can get more than the one millimeter, can go to a millimeter and a half. And when they become quite tight at the end, you need to slow down slightly so you can make it half a millimeter per day. Okay, and is there any age limit regarding using the distraction in osteoarthritic ankles? So the cutoff is 45 uh, years of age. We don't offer it to anybody above that age. Perfect. That's all the question at the moment. Thanks so much for this wonderful talk. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Hisham. Thank you so much. Welcome, Professor Sharma.
It's nice to see you again. Thank you. Uh, would you like to start, please? Yeah. If you please. Uh, can you see my screen? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. My apologies, the spelling of the basics have moved the S, so I'm sorry about that. I didn't see that. Uh, uh, so my remit today is <clears throat> to talk about uh, some, uh, uh, a, a bit about uh, X supports and this application. And what I will do is I'll concentrate more about uh, a bit about history and a bit about uh, the how it is uh, applied because uh, and uh, I, I'm not going to show you a lot of case examples but I think I'll consider more on the technique and uh, of the of the hexapods. Now initially it, it was the French mathematician uh, Augustine Cauchy who initially did the basic work on rigid polygons. And he also did a work on articulated octahedrons. And this, that forms the basis of the current hexapods. And his theory was further modified, but he was the first one to, to do the all the basic work on that. Uh, you must have heard Charles' theory and, and, and a lot of people who done mathematics and uh, uh, dynamics, they will know that uh, he he basically suggested, he, he and Poisson suggested that uh, all um, uh, movements can be centered around the, uh, uh, around the twisting on a, so, on, on a particular axis. And this theory was, uh, was further modified in the sense that the, in, in the projectile geometry, which basically su suggests that uh, it, it basically puts the complex structures in, in a 3D space. Uh, and that was the basic work which was done. Uh, this work was <clears throat> improved further and then this was probably the first patented uh, hexapod in 19, uh, done by the um, entertainment industry. Uh, then was another, uh, and then in 1942, there was another patent of the hexapods, but ultimately it was the Stuart Goff and, uh, who did the initial work and the Kapal uh, also contributed. But it is basically the, if you look at these two platforms, one is static and one moves. And these are attached by six variable struts and you can decide which platform moves and which, which platform is static. Um, the, the, this is the tire testing machine. It's a hexapod um, uh, like we use because a hexapod can, can give you three axis testing uh, and, uh, and, uh, and the tire industry used it uh, quite early on. And as I understand, uh, most of them still use it. It, it was basically Stuart who, uh, uh, the, the Stuart and Goff, they published the work separately, but uh, and I think uh, ultimately it's called, that's the reason it's called Stuart Goff platform. Then we know quite later on is, is the flight simulators which came on and all, and all our rides in the theme park which we use, they work on hexapods. But the first actually hexapod for the medical use was designed in, in, in 1984, it, it was a French for, uh, <clears throat> hexapod. I'm not sure it was actually used in, in clinical practice. I don't know that, but uh, it was the first one. And then there's another came from the uh, CCCP or sort of Russia in, uh, in those days. <clears throat> then there's a German frame we, which we have seen quite a lot. But I think the most popular one was by Charles Taylor, uh, which he, uh, and this was the, this is the first model and subsequently it has modified quite a lot. And we have seen um, a couple of modifications and then new one is coming out, I think in the in, in next six months or so. And there were a few other frames, but the, the, 
apart from TSF, the second most common frame is actually uh, TL hex, which is made by Orthofix as compared to TSF, which is made by Smith and Nephew. And uh, this was designed by Alex Cherkashin and, uh, and Mikhail Shamchukov. Um, and there are a few other frames as well. There are, uh, sorry, uh, uh, there are a few other frames as well. There's a smart frame, there's a door pillar is designed a frame. So there are a number of other frames, but basic principle of all frames remains the same. In principle, generally there are two most common type. One is ball and socket type, and this is a TLX and orthofix, or a, or a cardan type, which, which has got a universal joint. And there is uh, the third, probably the most popular one at the current time is an ortho SUV, which you have another talk later on um, uh, 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 today evening. Now, basically there's very little difference. And if you, um, uh, Chris Obst uh, pu published a paper comparing uh, carbon type and ball and socket type and basically, the, the principal difference is that one thing, one frame can do better than other, but I think it is the design of the struts in a TL hex in a carbon type, which is, sorry, ball and socket type, which is the, uh, uh, gives us a bit more edge in certain situations. But in principle, I think there is a very little difference in terms of what they can do. The biggest misconception is that hex support can do, uh, and you don't need to, hexapod can solve your problems and you don't have to know the principles, which is completely wrong, is the principles which are more important and hexapod is just a device which helps you achieve your goals and the principles remains the same whether using a laser frame or an hexapod frame. So when we're putting an hexapod frame, what do we need? We basically need, uh, three things. One, what is the problem? So what is the deformity, which means? And how we have placed this frame on the bone. So how, you, how we have mounted this frame on the bone. And we have to define the relationship between the center of the ring to a virtual point or a predetermined point which surgeon can choose and this is the relationship we need to define. And the last thing it is what hardware we, we have used. So if you look at the two frames as in sort of how to measure and do things, as I said, there's a, there are some differences, a lot of similarities. For example, TSF uses origin and corresponding point. TLX uses two different points, they call separately, but the measurement how you do is slightly different. But ultimately the both take a virtual point uh, which they measure everything. And this point is the virtual hinge, uh, which, the, uh, we, 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 which the computer software uh, uh, treats as a point where the corrections are done. Or this is the ACA, you can say. Now, what deformity mean, uh, uh, parameters, what is the problem? Is that the standard angulation in APN lateral plane translation, your rotation, whether the bone is long or the bone is short. So this is pretty standard. In TSF, you have to uh, measure it a, a little bit different from the corresponding point, but generally these are the things you need to have the identify your problem. Then how have you mounted the frame? And what frame, what the computer software needs to know is that you, the, the reference ring which you have chosen, how you have mounted in X, Y, and Z axis. And it is the distance from the center of the ring to the point, as I mentioned, uh, a point which, which a surgeon can choose wherever he or she wants. And the second thing we need to look at it is the ring perpendicular to the segment of the bone in AP and lateral plane. And this is the second requirement for the, so for the software. So if I can demonstrate the, the, uh, what I'm trying to say is, so if you see this is a ring uh, and this is the tibia and we put the bone in the center, but we all know 
that bone can tibia can never be in the center because of the soft tissue. So it's all always a bit of off centered. So let's say we identify a point in the center of the bone. So this is the virtual point I have identified in this bone. Now, if you look at it, this uh, second dot is the dot is the, which is the center of the ring. And in, all we need to know in AP plane, how far is this point from the center of the ring? And in the lateral plane, how far is this from the center of the ring? And this gives you the AP and lateral translation, which is how, how you have mounted the, 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 this ring onto the bone. And the third thing you need is the distance, which I'm going to show you in a minute. What hardware you've used, you need to ring size, what type of ring you've used, what is the length of the strut, and what mode you're using. And again, once you start using it, you'll be more familiar, but this is the hardware uh, which you need to tell the computer. So for example, let's take a TSI, which is the more common. So at the this osteotomy, which I'm going to correct my deformity after this as an origin, which is the virtual point. It is the predetermined point. This is the normal alignment of the bone. And then in day to day practice, how do you measure it? So you measure the ring diameter. It is the inner diameter, which we are interested in. And we, we divide it into half and that is the center of the ring. And the distance from the center of the ring to the alignment line is the distance, which is the AP frame offset. And in this case it's 12 millimeters. You, you, you minus the magnification and that gives you correct measurement in AP plane. Then how far is it away from the uh, your origin? So you again measure the distance, which is in this case is 74 millimeters proximal. And again, you, you minus the magnification from 74 and that, that gives you the distance from the uh, origin. And this, and this is the third measurement I was talking about earlier. In the lateral plane, again, is the same. You have to draw an alignment line. You have to find the diameter of the ring. You find the half of the distance and the distance from the center of the ring to this alignment line, which is where your origin is situated, is your lateral frame offset. And in this case, this is 15 millimeters minus the magnification is, and it is posterior center of the ring. So, so, so these are the measurements you need to take. Now, what are the advantages? <clears throat> there are a number of advantages. One, you, 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 you can correct a number of all three deformities, all three planes simultaneously. It is extremely versatile, easy to correct. And for patient's point of view, less morbidity because you make less correct changes in the frame. And therefore you, they come to clinic less, the traveling is less, and therefore it is much is a huge advantage especially in the complex uh, corrections it, it, it is a fantastic device and and this i'll give you an example this is in a 59 year old lady who 19 year old she's from 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 rwanda and in 1993 when there was a genocide she was running and she fell in a ditch and ultimately uh, and dislocated a knee, but because she would have killed, she kept on running with a dislocated knee, ended up in Zaire, and then ultimately uh, came to England 19 years later. And when I saw her, this was the situation she was in. And this was how she was walking for last 19 years. And, and this is her picture pre-operative on the table in theater. You can see that how unstable this leg is, or the, the, sorry, this knee is. And in this case, there are a number of things, but with a single, with a single frame, you can do everything. So first, what we have to do is we have to distract. So we pull it out gently until there is enough space between the tibia and the femur. Then you translate it posteriorly. And then 
you shorten it. Uh, uh, so at this point, um, I have to prepare the knee joint. You, then you shorten it and fuse it and, and put the compression. So without changing the frame, with a single frame, you can do everything. Um, and, and this is the advantage that you can do m multiple corrections in all three axes without changing the frame. Then how are the biomechanics different? And as we know uh, that in, in, in axial loading, TSF is significantly less rigid than an laser of frame but it's stiffer than a laser of in torsion and bending. And this is not, un, um, the, 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 this is not unexpected because if you see, because the nature of loading is oblique in a TSF because in the hexapod, because how the rings are, and as compared to a laser of frame, which is you, you, you have a longitudinal uh, loading. When, then the same group from Leeds, uh, Paul Harwood, he compared, uh, uh, and Dan Henderson, they, they compared the all wire on and all half pin frames. And then you, you realize here that all half pin frames is far more stiffer as compared to uh, Elizabeth Freeman, axial torsion and his share, and they all are statistically significant. So, so this is important to know that, uh, half pin do add more, more, more stiffness to the overall construct uh, in the circular frame. Then we tested uh, a TL hex versus TSF and we, come, we designed four ring frame. And this is the picture of the loading in the lab. And we reconstructed Elizabeth of frames in using the TSF and TLX rings and also uh, tested the hexapods. And if you look at it, if you look at the Elizabeth frame as such, you see that TL hex is far more stiffer than TSF Elizabeth. And in bending, there's a little bit more, but apart from that torsion, there's not much difference. If you compare to hexapods, again, TL hex is a, a, a bit more stiffer than TSF, but apart from that, in the, in the bending and torsion, there is not much difference between the two hexapods. Does the, does the hexapod delays the bone healing? We looked at it and we, uh, and we looked at it, um, 112 patients uh, between TSF and, and Elizarov, but importantly, we compared 34 shaft fractures in each group and there was no statistical difference in healing time. So healing time is, is no different uh, in, the, in the hexapods. So I would say, and I think we should always remember George Santayana. He, he said something very profound that we must remember that all the mistakes we have made in the past in terms of hand washing, hygiene, and in the same way, in, we should not just go for technology. Technology is only a device. Hexapods are only a device. We must not forget the principles or we will get into trouble and we'll have far more problems than what the technology can, can, can solve. So principles are important. We should not forget those. And the technology just helps us to achieve that, uh, achieve our goals. So, so to summarize, it's an excellent device which got uh, um, all three, uh, it can correct in all three axes simultaneously. That was a fantastic that way. It's a very, very precise and high accuracy. Uh, and in fact, high supports are used uh, for uh, uh, robotic surgeries. And it's very versatile and it's a powerful device and it makes surgeons life extremely easy. And although expensive, it's a fantastic device for complex deformities. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Sharma. Dr. Ahmed, can you start questions, yes. please? We have a question here. Um, a question from one of our colleagues. Uh, in double level deformity in single bone, how to use the TSF and which mode is preferred? Uh, 
if it's a two level deformity, then you will end up having a, a, a two TSF attached to each other. So what you call double stand. So, so there'll be one ring, two ring and three ring. And with each, between the each ring, there'll be an hexapod. So two hexapods will work independently of each other. What mode you use, entirely up to you. You can use the chronic mode. You can mode a to, use a to, 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 total residual mode. It really doesn't matter too much. Okay. Thank okay. You. Thanks, Prof. Uh, I think we have uh, no more questions, Dr. Ahmed. Thank you. Yes. Okay. No, yes. It's a pleasure to introduce my uh, dear colleague, Ahmed Sheikh, our upcoming star, inshallah. Uh, he is very active, very Thanks, brilliant. Ahmed. I wish him the most beautiful things in the world. Can you start, you. please, your talk? Yes, uh, yeah. can you hear me? Excellent. Um, it's a great pleasure here to be uh, on the stage uh, in this uh, wonderful course. And uh, I thank all the, I thank Prof. Muhammad Ashraf, head of the department, for his uh, intense efforts in this course. Also, Prof. Alam, the head of the unit, and of course, Prof. Gamal Hosni. It's a pleasure, especially, to be uh, uh, speaking after uh, Prof. Sharma, after his wonderful talk, which will help me a lot in this part. So, our my talk here is about ortho SUV potentials and limitations. It's again about the principles and what is the differences between the tools that you have. Uh, so when you know the tool, you can apply the principle. Uh, the objectives will be the uh, um, have a look on the evolution of circular frames, hexapods, which uh, Prof. Sharma already has done part of it. Then ortho SUV frame overview. And then clinical application and software calculation of the ortho SUV, what's different, and then in-depth analysis of the advantages and limitations. And finally, what are the clinical data and the current evidence of ortho SUV? So um, Elizarov external fixator, we all know, started by Gabriel Elizarov for various conditions, non-union osmolitis, dwarfism, congenital deformities, lengthening, fractures, wound defects. Later, as described in the previous lecture, Six axis external fixator, a uh, Stewart Goff platform, which would allow uh, uh, six degree freedom of movement to uh, do simultaneous corrections uh, depending on telescopic rules. Uh, finally, we got the TSF by the Taylor brothers, one engineer and one medical doctor who developed a computer program that based on the uh, uh, Chase's equations as described before to solve the problem and to get a, a computer program that do the correction and give you a table, then you apply the table on the frame and then you get it done. Was ortho SUV, Leonid Toleman and others developed the ortho SUV frame uh, 2009 based on Seward platform with some differences. First difference that it has three struts connected to each ring, not six as TSF. Some overview, it's not a frame. So this is the bigger difference. It can be attached to any bring TSF or TLX or whatever, or standard Elizarov. So they are just six struts. Uh, you got three length of the struts, standard, short, and long, but usually you do most of the work by the standard. You need the short for the kids. You need the long for the uh, knee uh, problems. No master tab, so you can start the, the, the frame either to the right a bit, to the left a bit, it's not a big problem. It can be attached to different levels, and we see this later. and you just keep in mind that this logo should be looking toward you and then the watch rule, which is uh, the, the first strut covered by the second one. Then this is number one, this is number two, and then you can counting counterclockwise as usual. When you apply this, according to the plan, you can apply it either in theater if you decide from, bef from before, or if this is something that happened in the middle and then you change your mind during the treatment plan, you can apply it in the clinic. And this is a big advantage. You don't have to be in theater to apply it. If a patient has standard Elizarov, then something went wrong and you need to do a correction, just put these struts, remove the connections of the Elizarov, and then you start. The strut length, you should have this number, the, the length of the struts, number one, two, three, four, five, six, and then you got to have the distances between these points. You got two triangles, the upper triangle and the lower triangle. And then these are the measurements that you need. What about the x-ray, you need to take the patient to the to have the x-ray with specific parameters 
not, not that much. Just you need number one to have the beam center. So it doesn't have to be at the ring. It doesn't have to be at the joint. No, whatever the beam center, you just put something to mark it. This is number one. Number two, the calibration mark, anything longer than 80 millimeters, just put it there so we can calculate according to it. Focal distance, the distance between the cassette and the tube, you just to measure this, and then you got to have all the six joints visible in the X-ray. We don't have the, uh, the rings to be uh, perpendicular to the bone. We don't have the rings to be line as TSF. It's a bit different, so you can get some obliquity, and it would be it, it, it would be fine. Then you start the the, the software. You enter the length. Uh, you uh, put the scale. How much is the road in the, uh, to to calibrate? Then you just draw lines according to the to the program on these struts. This is how this uh, software will understand the X-ray, how we understand where is the boon in this. It's a bit different to what, what we what, what's, uh, explained before in the TSF. Then this is the golden point of the TSF. But after this, he do the simulation and he, he is telling you that these red lines are the struts. Am I okay? So if the red lines are overlying of the struts, you are perfectly okay. So that all, everything that you have measured is accurate. Then you can move forward. Otherwise, you stop, you revise, you check your measurements, something wrong. And this is very, very important thing because without this, the software will not be understanding where the bone is properly. Then you draw simply, where is the cell segment and the axis? And then you start doing these trees, which would uh, uh, put the axis of the proximal segment, the cell segment, and then you can measure the amount of the deformity in each plane. This is the simulation. You, the rate of the correction, it's up to you. The recommended days, the software will recommend, then you can adjust. There are two types of struts which will not make a big difference. And then you will get this table. This table, six struts, and every day you do movements, plus or minus. What does it mean? So you got here to remove, to unlock this one and this one, and then the black part will move either in the negative side or the positive side. So every 90 degrees, every quarter is one, is half millimeter. So if the table is telling you plus two, so this will be in the direction plus and there will be two clicks, minus two in the minus direction and two clicks. That's it. So what are the strengths of this frame? So it's not a frame, it's just struts, so you can apply it to anything. It's flexible in the position of the struts in, in, in different things. The, uh, you can see that it, it starts not perfectly in the middle. It's a bit to the right, and that's fine also. Doesn't have to be perpendicular to the bone. These rings can be oblique without any problem, and the correction will go nicely. Measure strength, the attachment. As we said, as we saw before in the uh, TLX, SUV, uh, or TSF, or uh, other uh, hexapods, the struts should be between the two rings, but this is not. So you can attach here and you can attach there on the on other level. And this is a massive strength point, especially in, 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 in small, small legs, narrow distances. You can do this without any problems. So we don't have to worry about the seven or eight centimeters that we, we need to uh, leave between the two rings as a gold standard in TSF. Otherwise, the uh, struts will be too oblique and then will be too weak to do the correction. So it can handle with the narrow uh, distances. Again, no numbers to read, which is a good thing. So the, the patient will not worry about, is it 122 or 123, 124? No, he just do the correction either in the positive or the negative side. You just need to realign this line with this line. So you do the correction 90 degrees and then another line will come in front of this black line. So you don't have to read any numbers. The massive, another massive point, which is no strut change. So when the strut, these struts are a bit complex, there are three barrels moving onto each other. So this golden ring move toward one end with the correction. When it reach the end, this strut is done. You can't go farther. Then you do something tricky, which is called the reverse maneuver, but easily, Reset it to the middle, and then the patient can continue the 
so you don't have to do the strat change, which is another challenge in the TSF and other And one thing that I have already mentioned that the software check your back, watches your back. When you do the uh, simulation, he is giving this picture to you. And if the red lines are not coincide with the strut, something wrong. In this X-ray, the X-ray was just flipped on the other side. So the, the, the software does not give me the proper simulation. When I flipped it the right way, this was the result. So it checks you. Some weakness limitations, too much metal. It's especially in young legs. You, it's really very hard to understand what, what are these. But, but trust me, it's just a matter of experience that you can read this. Some difficulty in obtaining the proper X-ray, it will be a bit more or less equivalent to the TSF-1s. You just need to train the technicians to do this and then they will do it properly. Or difficulty on identification of the struts. There are some marks that help you in the first, but with time, you will be able to read the, the, these struts without even these marks. It's just a matter of training. Some weaknesses also, there are some weaknesses that it's a bit, uh, the interface is not that smart. It needs to be more user-friendly really. Um, and the frame itself, it's not that beautiful. You got some sticking bits here and there. It's just not like this one, which is uh, of course neater. But again, it does the job. It has some strength, so it's, uh, it's good. Where are we now regarding the clinical evidence? <clears throat> we got about six studies, six clinical studies published in Russian journals and only two studies published in Western journals. Most of the work came from two leading centers in St. Petersburg in Russia, Verdun Russian Research and Turner Scientific Research Center. Uh, it, and this is one limitation. This, this uh, kind of frame is not worldwide uh, uh, being used. There are in vitro studies that proved already the mechanical advantage. One study by Skomokorsko uh, uh, that he concluded that the orthodox UV has a higher rigidity and stronger resistance to deforming forces than standard LSR frame. Of course, nobody uh, uh, compared it to the TSF. The major clinical studies that we have, we got four clinical studies uh, on the orthodox UV comparing it to standard LSR in a variety of adult pediatrics congenital acquired femoral and tibial deformities. And all of these studies reach the same conclusion. It has higher accuracy, which already expected because this computer assisted correction. And number two, it has shortened the correction time, which would uh, of course uh, uh, reflect it on the whole, but more or less the healing time would be, would be the same. But when you cut short the correction time, of course, you just saved some time of the whole time of the frame, especially in complex deformities that you need to do some uh, uh, complex corrections simultaneously. Three more studies, uh, the outcomes of, uh, of its use in femur and tibia and foot deformities, the biggest 213 published by Vilniski et al. And uh, uh, they found that it's reliable to deformity correction with accuracy more than 90% in, uh, uh, in overall results. We got some experience with this myself, uh, uh, Mr. Nagam and Prof. Hosni in using uh, ortho SUV in 12 patients, 10 male and two females, uh, 10 tibia corrections, one distal femur and one joint uh, correction, tibia, uh, five proximal, four shaft and one distal at a mean age, uh, 39 years. And uh, I, I would not go in the depth, but just overview, we got some patient classic deformities like uh, genuvarum, idiopathic or blount. We got some um, new indications for this, like non-united uh, uh, fractures or neglected fractures that we apply it, uh, closed, and then do the corrections. Then you, you still can do this with standard Elizaro, but just it's a new indication as ortho SUV that nobody uh, reported this before. Acute trauma, it's not reported anywhere that it's used as TSF in acute trauma. And this uh, 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 fracture, we just apply the uh, rings leave the deformity and then uh, uh, reduce it gradually with the earth SUV and then let it heal. Uh, one new uh, um, indication also, the uh, docking site alignment, this gentleman after uh, doing the uh, bone transport has some alignment docking site and then it's, it, it's, very, it's very, very small uh, space, very small amount of deformity, but it gets it perfectly done. So if you got some patient with Elizaro uh, for fracture treatment, and then you got some rotation or some uh, uh, residual deformity, you can just throw the struts, do the correction, 
remove it and you get it done and the patient will not back to the uh, theater again. So to conclude here, hexapods on its own aim to get easier, possibly faster, more precise deformity correction. Orthos UV is capable of giving a more specific advantages in correcting the uh, deformities because of its versatility and flexibility. Of course, we need further comparative assays to compare its value in comparison to other hexapods. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ahmed. Thank you, very nice, well-illustrated presentation. Uh, you have only one question here. Uh, I think you can manage it now, or you prefer to? Yeah. Okay. It is about a clinical case. Uh, a... I think so, yeah. I have, I have 55 years old patient with bilateral marrow fracture complicated with compartment syndrome. What would be the correct management in rural community where <laughs> there is alone as GP? It's compartment syndrome is a, just emergency. You can't do this in, in a rural community. You have to uh, get transferred as soon as possible. Um, you just to save the limb, you need urgent fasciotomy. So this is the straightforward answer for this. Another question, can we use Elizaro rings with a stress of hexapod? You can use this with ortho SUV, but not with TSF hex or uh, TLX or whatever other type of, uh, of uh, uh, hexapods. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ahmed. Now we move to my dear friend, Professor Gamal, and his talk about basics of the lengthening. Can you start, sir, please? Thanks, Ahmed, for the introduction. And I'm going to speak about the limb lengthening, which is, uh, it's a broad term. I'm not hearing you well. Please, can you raise your voice? Okay. If we talk about limb lengthening, we are talking about a broad term. It's involving a lot of things. This is the conclusion. Many papers now, they start from the conclusion. There is a paradigm shift, limb lengthening towards lengthening nails. And you ought to convince everybody he had that he has to shift to lengthening nails. Unfortunately, they have just replaced the external fixator complications by lengthening nails complications and no more because nothing has changed with the biology of limb lengthening. Nothing has changed. It's almost the same healing index. So what difference does it make if you put something inside or something outside? And they insist that the, the patients they hate the external fixator. Even in trauma cases, uh, polytrauma patients, and the comatose patients, and, on, and I wonder how they have asked the, the comatose patients, do they like, did, they, did they like it or not? I don't know. Anyhow, the first question, are we talking about the same patient? Or we are talking about two totally different patients? Because I've seen the papers speaking about the nails, talking about 1.5 centimeter lengthening and 1.6 millimeter lengthening or a centimeter lengthening. I've never lengthened somebody for 1.5 or 2.5 centimeters. And I wonder, when you talk about this small short distance and you talk about complications, are you wanna, do you wanna to compare 1.5 centimeter lengthening with 22 centimeter lengthening distance? And this is the start of lengthening. Perhaps this was Codivella, 19.5. This is the evolution. The definitely the breakthrough was in reserve, not by the fixator, by the biologic law or the biologic law of tension stress. History of reserve in the Middle East started with Banha. In 1983, Professor Graal Kazim, he was the chairman of the department at the time. He imported all, all the external fix, uh, Lazarus external fixator, even the many fixator. And I wonder why he imported all that stuff at the time. And you see, this was the old arch for the femur. It was a huge one for the femur. And the way we were fixing the wires at the time was very, 
with few holes over the fixator. And we've been using it for, especially for trauma cases for some time at the time. So it was 1983. My experience, I have presented my experience in this paper and you can get it at any time. It was my 37 years experience with limb lengthening. You can get it. It's open access journal. Um, perhaps the way the old Egyptians were treating the short pe people were amazing because many gods at the time were like God Besa and Gabita were a condor placing. And the society attitude to the deformity, the society attitude to the deformity was different. There was no discrimination. And you see the belly dancing in the temple. And one of the belly dancers are very short, you see here. But there was no discrimination. And this was human rights about 5,000 years before Christ. Sneb, Sneb was a prime minister, something like a prime, something like a prime minister. And you see he was a chondroplastic, married to a normal woman and has two normal children. He was very rich at the time. Again, this is a butcher. You see how short he was. Musicians. This is the history. What's the aim of, ben length, of limb lengthening? Limb length inequality, functional improvement, or cosmetic lengthening? I have a real problem. I have a real problem with the people, you know, having a lot of videos on the internet, you know, with the uh, pandemic, COVID-19 pandemic, we started to use the online teaching and we started to have a look on the YouTube and something. And unfortunately, we have some people talking about the greatest experience in limb lengthening and deformity on the world. And the other experience is just cosmetic lengthening cosmetic lengthening by intramedial nail. So their experience is something like the residents experience with the interlocking nails. You know, the residents, they do a lot of interlocking nails. So it's doing interlocking, just like interlocking nails. In normal people, they consider themselves the most experienced people in the world. We discovered something new, which is very funny. So when we talk about limb lengthening and deformity correction, we talk about such cases with 100, 180 degrees rotation of the foot, 12 centimeter shortening, 90 degrees angulation. You see the lengthening, derotation, which is some sort of rotational lengthening. Do you get this picture? So we're talking about perhaps changing lives, not just lengthening. See, 110% for arm lengthening. You see here, with amputated foot and replantation, 22 centimeter lengthening. And even the cosmetic lengthening we're doing. You see the distance. It's not 1.5 millimeter cosmetic lengthening. It's far more. It's far more. So I think we, do, we are not speaking about the same patients. We are talking about two different things. The second point is the biology of limb lengthening. Do we have any change in the biology of limb lengthening? Since the general biological law of tension stress? No, we didn't have any advance. We're still trying. We still have the same thing, osteotomy or corticotomy. The biology is the same. We have three stages, latency period, distraction, and consolidation phase. We are trying to stimulate the regeneration area, not by putting external fixation or internal fixation. 
using systemic methods like bisphosphonates or local bone morphogenic protein, PRB or something. What's the evolution? We cannot talk about the evolution of limb lengthening. We can talk about the evolution of bone lengthening devices. It's not, we are not talking about the limb lengthening at all. We are talking about the devices. We started from just a skeletal traction, to unilateral fixator, to circular fixator, to TSF, hexapodal. Finally, with internal bone lengthening nails, whatever, adhesion nail, ISKD, fit bone precise. Each one of them, during the start, they, come, they, they claim that they have no complications. And after 10 years, at the end of the patency, we see all the complications on earth and so on. So we have start lengthening followed by nailing, which we don't know, we don't do because of the infection possibilities. Lengthening over elastic nailing, lengthening over submuscular locking plates, lengthening the plating, and finally internal lengthening devices. Currently, we have the uh, guichet or albigia nail, the fit bone, and precise. The indications for limb lengthening, the indications are controversial. Why controversial? Because if you have limb length discrepancy, and people claim if you have shortening less than two centimeters, you don't lengthen two to four, you are in the gray zone, more than four centimeters, you have to lengthen. But sometimes you forget that the length of the heel, because sometimes the heel is very short and adds shortening to the measured shortening. Dwarfism, do we lengthen dwarfism or not? Do we lengthen it? Is it a cultural issue or something you have to do? Cosmetic lengthening, again, you have to do cosmetic lengthening. So it's a controversial issue. Again, the indications for the nails. And this is just an example of fibrohemia and two raised foot. And remember that sometimes you have to do lengthening and deformity correction at the same, and gradual deformity correction. Because again, the people, they wanna say they, they do something new. So they do acute correction with lengthening. What's new? Long, long time ago, all what we knew about deformity correction is acute conformity correction. And the people quit, quit because of the high rate of complications. But people now, they don't like to record complications. They said, no, it's safe. Why on earth is safe? Oh, it's safe for years and years. For the case, we were doing acute correction of deformance and they quit because of the high rate of complications. If you speak about the complications and people, they would like to talk about their experience and look to the papers talking about the experience. People talk about doing for 63 years, a long 25 years. That means they do two patients per year and it's not one surgeon, many surgeons. So every surgeon has the experience of doing one operation every six months. What type of experience is that? Why do people forget about the surgical load? If we talk about arthroplasty, knee arthroplasty or hip arthroplasty, they always talk about the surgical load. If you want to be a professional in hip arthroplasty, you have to do some, some numbers per week or per month. But if you want to do lengthening and the deformity correction, the people, they forget that at all. So the surgeon who is doing 300 um, cosmetic lengthening per year, consider himself the most experienced person in the formative correction. Why on earth? Complications. We have numerous complications. We all know this. And treatment of or lengthening is a post-operative problem. We have pentrike infection. Poor regenerate formation, premature consolidation, axial alignment, malalignment, 
I look here to these patients. There's non-union, subacondylar non-union, cortocotomy, bone transport, compression and lengthening. Who's non-union? In the distal part, we have premature consolidation of the regenerative. Can you imagine complications can happen in any case with any rate? There is no guarantee. So we have two premature consolidation of regenerative in this old guy. And another one, you see the bone formation in the femur. Again, you see the bending of the frame and you have a deformity because of the strong muscles, you see the strong muscles. And you can correct it gradually. And you have this picture at the end, post-operative problems. Common peroneal nerve problem. You can leave your wire flush here, so you cannot injure the common peroneal nerve. And we have to remember the ISKD and the numerous complications which appeared in the 10th year of the pregnancy. Not all the complications are the same. If you have one case of deep infection, you have to think about it twice. Here we have the people talk about the physiotherapy and if you wanna do lengthening, you should have uh, um, a center, a specialized center and too many people working with you or something. We don't believe in such a thing. Many of our patients are coming from 1,000 kilometers, 800 kilometers, and they are poor. And some people claim that bone lengthening has to be for rich people because it's very expensive operation. This is not true. It's not an expensive operation. We do it for all the patients. All the patients have the same type of care as you see here. And this is physiotherapy. When you allow the patient to walk, swimming, using the computer, hospital stay. It's daycare or one day. We allow the patient to go home after a few hours or on the next day. So we reduce the expenses. We need to, we wanna correct the deformities for all the complicated cases. And we have too many, too many of them. If you speak about one case every six months and we speak about per list, perhaps five to seven cases in each list. So it's totally different. Perhaps we don't talk about the same thing, or perhaps we are talking about different patients, perhaps we are talking about different expressions. We don't know the costs. And I will give an example of achondroplasia, the cultural differences. We don't have facilities for short stage here. So that's why we, we do lengthening for most of the cases we meet. We have stages. The first lengthening, very young age, five to six, then femoral nine to 11. Second lengthening for the tibia and the humoral lengthening 15. We finish before going to the university because all the problems starts with the universe, all the psychological problems. We do transverse lengthening. And we do all the patients, even the very poor patients like here. He used the cardboard to transfer the patient, the family used it not an ambulance. So with such a patient, we have lengthening of the tibia for 13, for 17 centimeters. We always do long distances. We don't do short distances. You see here for the tibia, for the femur, 13 centimeters, 13 centimeters. So it's all 30 centimeters for the femur and tibia. Then the patient left and they came after five years to have lengthening of both humeri. She was old and she's working. And this is the end picture. Even older patients, 53 years old, female with a chondroplasia, and you see the deformities, and by focal lengthening and correction of the deformity. Cosmetic lengthening. This is Tutankhamun, if you see here. See the beauty, thousands of years ago. So we, we do cosmetic lengthening and many people, they need cosmetic lengthening. And you have to compare or to take care of the expectations of the patients and the reality. 
And this is an example of the cosmetic lengthening using external fixator. Upper extremity lengthening. Again, many people, again, it's upper extremity lengthening. Why? Because they think upper extremity is similar to the, and sometimes they, should, they consider the humerus like the femur or something. And also they claim that perhaps the, the function will be less after lengthening. We didn't have this experience. And this is an example of humeral lengthening. Almost always, we don't have a complication with the shoulder. You see 110% lengthening of the radius, a radial club hand, phalangeal lengthening. You see the distance, it's 100% of the shortening of this amputated finger. We do multiple at the same time, so. Okay. You see the distance. The magnitude of lengthening. Some people put the, uh, the basics that you have to do lengthening less than 20%. And because, because why? Because they have a uh, experimental study on rabbits using rabbits. And they discovered in the rabbits that if you, if you lengthen more than 20%, you're going to have more complications. But I, I, I almost tell them we are not rabbits. We cannot count on this experimental study with very short number of animals that you, we, we don't have this experience at all. And this is like, this is tattoo tibial humilia. And you see the stages of lengthening. You see 10 centimeter lengthening. And the second stage, you see how the length You know what happened with the, but the patient can move. See the lengthening. At the end, we corrected the vulgus deformity here and another six centimeter lengthening and osteotomy of the carvus to correct the deformity. Again, human lengthening. The basics again, 20%. You see the pictures. You see 20%, this is 20%, but look now, the family decided to continue and we have 115% lengthening, nothing happened to the shoulder. And after that, we decided to continue the same thing. So we don't have a limit 20%. We don't believe in such basics. Basics, by, basics and rules which are based upon, upon nothing. Again, look to the amputated foot. And the surgeon, they decided to remove most of the tibia to have shortening and replantation. See, it was done in Kenya, not, in, not here. And presented to me with this picture, non-union deformity and shortening 22%. See, lengthening five centimeter. 10, 15, 22 centimeter lengthening. Where is the rule of 20%? I don't know anymore. So the limb lengthening, you have to remember the surgeon volume has a great effect on the patient outcome. We are trying to make a research about that. There are many difficulties, but in our experience, the role of surgeon volume is very important. It's exactly like total hip and total knee. And this volume is not based only upon the operating theater, but the volume in the outpatient clinic. So if somebody wants to have more experience with limb lengthening, I advise him to come to my outpatient clinic. When we work each day for about six or seven hours and we see the patients, we change the frame and we see the complication. This is the real life experience with limb lengthening. Again and again, we don't have animation experience. We don't have, we don't do animations. We notice that some people say, we don't, I don't have complications. And yes, because he has animation. In animation, if you have animation, 
No complications. With animations, there are no complications because all of your presentations are animations. Thank you so much. You cannot get complications from animations. But if you have a huge real patience with shortening and the format is, I'm sure you are going to see too many complications. And the pretty thing and the real experience is to show the people how you manage the complications. Not to say that I don't have complications because I'm the best surgeon in the world. Why we have too many patients? Why patients with deformities in our facility are something like influenza in the West? Because we have high incidence of neglected trauma. Too many people, victims of conflicts are coming for us from this area. Too many of them, too many are young. One third of the population in this area and in the Middle East is under the age 15. They move a lot and they have high incidence of trauma, high incidence of congenital deformities. And some people speak about one per million live birth, but remember that about less, about 30% of the marriages in our area are consanguineous marriages. And in other areas in the Arabic world, maybe more than 50% are consanguineous marriages. So we have to know when we talk about limb lengthening and deformity correction in the Middle East, and we compare it with other facilities, perhaps we are talking about two different things. In conclusion, we've talked about limb lengthening. We don't have to forget the experience, especially with the follow-up of the patients. Which field do you are doing limb lengthening? We have, before we start, when you talk about your experience, tell us your experience. If it was cosmetic lengthening, is it with trauma patients? Is it with congenital deformities? Which one? I've seen one talking about tibial hemilia and he talks about that he has the highest number of tibial hemilia of the world and he told me about this and I've told him, if you do go to uh, al Aini Abu Rish unit, you'll find far more patients than the patient you presented yourself. Why you, why you say something that you are, have the highest number, the largest number of people? Because you don't want to see other people. You see yourself. You see yourself in the mirror. Try to avoid the mirror, please. Many surgeons just do cosmetic lengthening. And others, you do advertisements and animations, animations. And you call this an experience. Remember the complication rate. And if you see the papers and the complication rate, remember some of the patients I calculated, people are coming with from five centers, each center has three uh, orthopedic surgeons, and you call it multi-center study. And I found out that the experience of each surgeon is 0.1 patient per year, 0.1 patient per year. And can you imagine each one is doing one patient every 10 years. In conclusion, limb lengthening is a rapidly developing field of orthopedic surgery. Currently, it's a standard procedure with predictable, predictable results. Indications have been extended to include upper extremities and cosmetic lengthening. I think experience has a great impact on the results of different procedures because follow-up and management of expected complications are cornerstones of the treatment strategy. Unfortunately, the English literature has many papers with relatively small numbers of patients operated upon by many surgeons over a long period of time. This means that the experience of the individual surgeon is based only one or few cases per year. Sometimes it's difficult to get valid conclusions from the reported mixed data. In spite of the introduction of promising intramedial lengthening nails and computer assisted external fixation, we still count on LSR of biologic laws, not changed till now. Advances through research to simulate regeneration and reduce the period of treatment will be the rare revolution in lengthening surgery. I'm waiting, we are all waiting for the rare revolution, the biologic solutions, not, not the hardware. Thank you.
and this is my paper. If you want to see my philosophy, you can have it. It's open access. There is no, in conclusion, one word, there is more than one solution for each problem. Hey, people, don't try to convince me that there is only one solution and you want everybody to shift towards one thing. It's my conclusion. There is more than one solution for each problem. Thank you. Thanks so much, uh, my dear prof, uh, Professor Gamal Hosni, for this uh, wonderful talk. As, as usual, we keep learning from you. Uh, just a couple of questions, um, if you get some time. Uh, is there any age limit to lengthen the bone? What is the maximum length that we that can be gained? Age limit and maximum length. We don't have an age limit. We don't have an age limit at all because I've lengthened 83 years old man because he had 10 previous operations for infected non of the tibia and he had 13 centimeters shortening and we lengthened him for 13 centimeters and there was no problem. The biologic law of lengthening is valid for each age. And sometimes you have to do it. For with other patients, 83, 65, 34, two years old. It depends upon the indication why you are going to do it. In congenital pseudosus tibia, you can do bone transport and lengthening at age two. So we don't have <clears throat> a limit whether uh, the limit for the younger age or the older ages. So another co uh, two questions with the same content. Uh, tibia lengthening, what about the comparinal nerve injury in 16 centimeter lengthening or humeral lengthening, what about the radial nerve affection? How would you uh, protect it during lengthening or do something specific? Uh, for lengthening for such a long distances, we don't have a problem with the nerves. As long as you are lengthening, one millimeter per day, and if you have any symptoms, you can reduce the rate of uh, distraction to uh, 0.75 or 0.5 millimeter per day. But, you know, I've, I've had thousands of lengthenings, and in my experience, most of the complications of the common perineal nerve are iatrogenic, not because of lengthening for such a long distance. Sometimes, immediately after the operation, you don't know why, perhaps there was the course of the radial nerve, it's not exactly the regular course. And you have to remove the offending agent immediately. And usually you have recurrence. Sometimes you need to do release of the nerve. Sometimes with the, 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 during lengthening, you have this also compression by something of the offending agents. And Usually there's no problem with long distances with the common peroneal nerve. And I didn't see in the literature a relationship for the rate of complication of the common peroneal nerve between the, the magnitude of lengthening and the development of common peroneal nerve palsy. Okay, thank you, Prof. We stop. Uh, there are a couple of questions, but uh, just not to be late. Uh, so move to the next speaker, uh, Prof. Ahmed Alam, uh, Professor of Orthopedics at Banham University. Talking about the femoral lengthening, uh, the monolateral choice. How would you do this with the monolateral fixator? Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Assalamu alaikum. Hi, everyone. Is the sound clear, Dr. Ahmed? Yes, Prof. Okay. Femoral bone lengthening with monolateral frames. This is my disclosure. Limb lengthening should be considered for patients with limb length discrepancy. Professor Ahmad, the, the, uh, the presentation is not yet uh, shown. Not yet shown. OK, one moment, please. One moment, please. No worries. Okay. Just restart there. Sure. Uh, 
I don't know why. Still not working. No, no. Uh, no uh, you stop the share. Just start the share again, please. Share screen and then choose it. I don't know what is missing here. Do you try the share screen button when you when you press it? Yes, one moment, please. Yes. Is it starting now? Yes, 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 yes. yes bro. Sorry for this. Full screen. Full screen, please. I think there's a technical problem, yeah. Is it clear now? Yeah, yeah, yes. It's quite clear. Okay, I want Go to- Go ahead, sir. It's clear. Okay. Femoral bone lengthening with monolateral frames. This is my disclosure. It is known that limb lengthening should be considered for patients with limb length discrepancy of four centimeters or more. Although limb lengthening procedures are associated with impressive gains in length, studies show that the rate of complications is equally impressive. Limb lengthening has been reported to be associated with a high complication rate. This data from about 40 years ago, from Wagner started his physical lengthening till now, is still reporting a high complication rate for lengthening. That is because shortening could be associated with different multiple problems like bone loss, bone deformities, skin problems, other soft tissue and or joint contractures, infection, and so on. So a competent frame and the proper surgical techniques are a must to achieve good results and leasing complications. From my own point of view, the use of monolateral simple frames can reduce this complication rate. I want to illustrate that we have something that is called Lizarov disease that affects some of orthopedic surgeons. As Dr. Gamel said in his lecture, don't search for one solution for all problems. Some orthopedic surgeons believe that everything is treated with Elizarov technique. Elizarov is just a way of thinking. Nailing is another way. Ring fixator, another way. Monolateral fixators, blading, all are ways of thinking. So we will have this talk and the upcoming talk of tibia lengthening from this clinical point of view. We have a lot of clinical cases to illustrate that it is not only the monolateral or reserve ring that could be used. We can do a lot of things to solve patients' problem. This study was conducted with about 56 patients, males mostly, with an average age of 36 years, with a range of from 15 to 57, with shortening from 6 to 17 centimeters, with a long follow-up up to 8 years or more. We have different etiologies for limb shortening. We have post-traumatic, about 50% of cases, congenital shortening, 25% of cases, volumeylitis, 17%, and cases with old bone infection, 7%. All were treated with a modified Wagner or a modified orthofix frame. The Lizard of method of corticotomy callotesis was applied to all cases except 10 cases of bolu where a corrective osteotomy was done to treat the hand to knee gate and another 14 cases with old male union to treat shortening or angulation. This was done at the metaphysis 
or at the physical site, except eight cases where the osteotomy or corticotomy was done at a diaphyseal site. My focal technique was used in 10% of cases, and the femora were lengthened to an average of nine centimeters from range to six to 17, which is equal to nine to 56% of the original femoral bone length. The other data are as usual, duration distraction, average rate of distraction, total treatment duration, and the average healing index was as usual. Complications were classified to major and minor. We have 64 minor and eight major complications with a total complication rate of 43%. The most common complications received were pain tract infection, about 70% of cases, mild to moderate pain tract infection, virus distal femoral segment, which was corrected during lengthening, about 14% of cases, and the average residual discrepancy was about two millimeters. Don't forget, a residual shortening was always intended in cases of old, old polio, myelitis, to leave a space for the foot for clearance during walking. Final end results were graded as excellent and good in about 80% of cases, 17% fair, and nearly no poor cases. Some case presentations, this is a male 35 years with 6.5 centimeter shortening due to volumeylitis, and he have fixed flexion knee deformity about 20 degrees. Is a recurrent osteotomy and the removed bone which was fragmented and used as a local autobone graft is the recurvatum to the right. This is immediate post-operative photo for the patient. This is 5.5 centimeters length, 70 days post lengthening. This is 21 weeks post operative. This is four years post operative with full canalization of the distal femur. And this is also four years post operative photos for the patient and the knee range. This is a case of bifocal lengthening. We have here propagation of the corticotomy or osteotomy to one of the pins without affecting on it. This is a frame up and down. It is closed, not open yet, here and here. This is serial X-rays, nine weeks post-operative, four months post-operative. This is the frame open to its maximum desired length, four months post-operative, and this is a time of fixator removal. And we are a case of bullion with 9.5 centimeter shortening, the same sequel. This is three years post-operative, this is a pre-operative hand to knee characteristic for cases of poliomyelitis. This is 11 months post-operative. This is 20 months post-operative is still improving in gait and walking and posture. This case of congenital short femur, which suffered from all the fracture resulting in malunion, distal femoral epiphyseal arrest leading to 17 centimeters shortening and 30 degrees anterior femoral angulation. This is a corrective, corrective diaphyseal osteotomy, two months, 200 days post-operative, one year post-operative, you see the frame, still no signs of loosening or infection around pins. And this is two years post-operative AB lateral and oblique views. These are 17 centimeters lensing in one bone. This is equal to 55% of the original femoral lens in this patient. Another case of old fracture femur, which was treated by blade, blade was fractured, nailing was done, nail was infected, repeated debridement, repeated grafting. After being calm for some time, another nail was introduced, this one nail. He did five previous operations, ending in this eight centimeter shortening and the still non-union. You see the playing and telescoping of the nail inside bone. This is debridement, adding more shortening. 
it became short more 12.5 centimeter after debridement and acute compression. Serial X-rays showing the regenerate proximally, the union of the non-union site, the pins about one year post-operative with no signs of infection or any loosening. We always start partial weight bearing. Sorry. We start partial weight bearing as we have progress of the regenerate. And with progressive callus formation, we move to full weight bearing as the patient shouldn't remove the external fixator before achieving full weight bearing at least six weeks before that time. Dr. Ahmed Sheikh, I have technical problem. You are with me? Yes, Prof. Ahmed. Uh, one moment, please. I think the windows stopped working. I should restart it. Sorry for this. It's not responding. Uh, let me start. Uh, stop the share from my side. Try it now. Anything? Yeah, thank you. When you started from your side, it worked again. You have something? You. You can start it now. I just stopped it. Yeah. Is my st screen sharing with you now? No. No. Not sharing. Okay. Okay. I should just start sharing again. Where is it? That it is. Okay. Yes. It is sharing now? Yes. Yes. I can see it. We'll move the last full full slide. screen, Prof. Ahmed. Yes, I will move first to last slide. Yes. And this is a patient after removal of the frame. He can walk on the floor and ceiling, as you can see. Frame was removed and we changed it to interim gallery nailing. Still sharing, Dr. Ahmed? Yes, yes, sir. Another stop, I don't know why. Uh, yeah. This is another case. Female, 18 years old, who suffered old fracture right femur and ileum eight years ago. She had blade fixation, non union, bone grafting twice, non union, replating and the graft. Infection occurred, blade removal, external fixation application, debridement two times. Eradication of infection four years ago, but still have deformity, limping, and this evident shortening. This is her X-ray down. This is X-rays. Something slowing my machine, I don't know why. She have clinically no side to side instability or telescopic instability, completely painless. You can call it atrophic non-union, stable fibrous or unstable non-union. She had osteoporosis, she has shortening 11 centimeters with failed the previous six operations with functional good range zero to 90 degrees. If we make some drawings, The plan was to cut this non-union site in this way. This is the cut part. After opening it, it is like a pseudo joint. 
and fixator assisted internal fixation another way of thinking was done this is a blade and to really place this is bone graft interscroping fixation to have space for the pins because the blade is long enough to have no space distance the proximal to apply these two stations of pins here and here. So, so we have inter screw pin fixation. This is subtrochantric corticotomy. Seven months later, this is a regenerate proximally. And this is a patient partially bearing weight at the start. Gradually full with bearing with the frame on. Gradually, we start dynamization by decreasing the number of pins, moving the heavy frame and application of a lighter frame to allow more stresses to the fracture. Patient is allowed to bear weight to mobilize her knee well. Sorry, two slides were missed, not important. This is another case of congenital shortening of the femur and tibia. 18 centimeters femoral, 18 centimeters tibial. Total 36 centimeters shortening. This is half of the problem. The other half is here. When you have the side view, it is apparent here in the X-ray, the proximal tibia is malunited about 100 degree posterior angulation. When the patient extends her knee fully, her knee is locking to the ceiling. Her foot is locking to the ceiling. This is full knee extension. This is full knee flexion. This is simultaneous lengthening of the femur and tibia and the correction of the tibial deformity and the application of a small plate and enter screw pin formation here for the upper tibia. And this is a patient after the end of the procedure, two years approximately. So to conclude, the uniaxial frame was found to be easy to apply in a relatively short time, is fixed in place with large hand screws, has a good range within which angular adjustments could be made. It has good patience, vulnerability, and accepted rate of complications. Thank you very much. Thank you, Prof. Alain, for this uh, nice talk about how to use the uh, monolateral frame to do the femoral lengthening. Um, sorry for the, uh, for dear colleagues, we, we are not able to take the uh, questions at the moment. Sorry, we need to move forward. Okay. Um, going back to uh, Professor Gamal Hosni and um, his talk about the joint deformity, how would you deal with it? Joint deformities. Is it different from the metaphysical deformities or the sharp deformities? This is joint deformity of the knee, joint deformity of the hip, the knee, ankle. Perhaps this was the first time to treat a joint deformity by intramedullary something you see here. In this 3,000 years old mummy. Now I'm trying to answer some questions. If you have a joint deformity, are you going to operate or not to operate? Do you have a desirable deformity? Can we create a malalignment for improving the function of the patient? What about the progression of the deformity? Does it make difference if you have a rapidly progressive deformity or a slowly progressive deformity? The ligamentous that lacks to, does it make, does it make a difference? Does it make a difference to, if you have a ligamentous laxity? 
when you have a joint deformity, are you co going to correct it? Intra-articular or extra-articular or both of them? What about the secondary deformities? Because I, well, I've seen that many times. The children, they go with a joint deformity to the pediatric orthopedic surgeon and you always tell them, uh, please come after one year or two years and make another x-ray. And the patient has a deformity of the ankle. And at adolescence, the patient has another deformity, fixed deformity of the foot. So if you want to correct, you have two fixed deformities, the primary deformity and the second deformity. And why on earth you want a patient, the patient to wait to develop another deformity? We want to make life easier, not worse. So if you have this deformity, this is the hip joint deformity, this is not a trial to uh, see the angle of antiversion. No, this is some sort of congenital short femur which was not described in the literature. The femur lies transverse, 90 degrees. And if you have such a patient, I had a patient long time ago and I corrected the flexion deformity, but it came back within a few months. So this is the patient. What about the decision to operate? The patient is functioning normally. She runs, she goes to school alone. She has an almost normal life. So the decision was not to operate. You see the small alignment on such a patient. Don't talk about the deformity. This is my patient. This is the polio, all the poliomyelitis patient with quadriceps zero. So we decided to do a hyperextension deformity here to push the weight bearing axis anterior to lock the knee during walking. So sometimes malalignment can be desirable. Progression of the deformity. You see such a case with this deformity and another case with the deformity. Does it make difference if it is progressive or not? You see this patient, this is physiologic gene of arm or vulgum. And you see it's a regressive deformity and you have to wait because it's regressive. Why you want to correct it? In all the po in also rachitic, rachitic gene of arm, you have to wait. You have to wait even more. We wait after healing the rects, we wait at least one year because sometimes you have reversal of the deformity. So it's better to wait such situations. But you see in such a case, all years disease, hereditary, uh, it's a progressive deformity. You see the deformity is progressive. So you have to correct it. Otherwise the patient will develop other deformities. Hip joint deformities are too many. You can have coxavara, coxavalga, absent head and neck. You see ununited neck. And you can correct the deformity. You always draw the anatomic axis of the femur, of the upper femur, and the axis of the neck. And you have the neck shaft angle, which is 131 degrees. And the break or the the, me, the, me, the mechanical proximal femoral angle, which is the center of the proximal femur from the center of the head to the tip of the trochanter. With this angle, it's about 90 degrees. So you have to divide between deformity of the neck, it's angle, neck and shaft angle, and the trochanter. And these are the methods to correct the proximal femur. You can use a plate to correct the angle, a regular plate, external fixator. You have too many methods to correct. Pelvic support osteotomy. Sometimes you don't have the upper femur. And you can use the support osteotomy, pelvic support. It's subtrochanteric valgus osteotomy, which is was suggested about 200 years ago. 1838, Elizarov just added another osteotomy to correct the mechanical axis and to do lengthening. So it's not a new operation. We have high support or low support. 
When you read the literature about the pelvic support, now you can see only the lost lost child. And I've seen a paper of eight cases done from five centers. Each center had three operative surgeons. And they talk only about the low surgeon, the uterine does a heart osteotomy, will create problems. I didn't see any in the literature for the people doing high osteotomy. And you see, this is high osteotomy. If you do low osteotomy, you lost a lot of length. Why? So you can do high osteotomy and lengthening at the same time. And this is the follow-up after 13 years. The patient has still have some residual yes, shortening, yes, but she refused yes. end, any interference. Yes. She doesn't want another yes. operation. And then she's, she's can doing all the functions. She can squat. Squatting is important in our area. This is 13 years of follow-up. The question, the usual question, what about the arthroplasty of the pelvic support osteotomy? Pelvic support osteotomy is not done to postpone the arthroplasty. It's done for good. That means if you do pelvic support osteotomy, the patient, the patient will not need an arthroplasty operation. And this is low osteotomy. Another low osteotomy in such patients. The patient had hip dysplasia on both sides. And she presented to me at the age 17 and we did pelvic support osteotomy on the left side, left hand side. Before doing pelvic support osteotomy, we sent the patient to arthroplasty surgeon who is doing arthroplasty for the young age. And we let him try to convince the patient with the arthroplasty talking about the effect, the uh, best things and the uh, problems with the long-term problems. Also, we discuss the uh, operation for the family and we let them see the results and we ask them to wait for one month and decide. So then they decided for the length at age 17 to have pelvic support osteotomy. And this was the result. She can squat. She's having good life. Anyhow, after seven years, she started to have severe pain on the right side. And this is after four years before developing the pain. See the way she moves. Equal leg length after the first pelvic support osteotomy of the left side. Then after seven years, she started to have severe pain at night of the right side with severe osteoarthritis. At the time, I failed to convince her. The arthroplasty surgeon convinced her that he had at this age he had arthroplasty of the right side and now it's another five years of follow-up and she's okay with the pelvic support on the left side and arthroplasty on the right side what about the knee joint deformity if you have a knee joint deformity long time ago we've learned that if you have a vulgar deformity you have a supracondral femoral problem and you have a vers deformity, that means you have an upper tibial problem. This is not true. If you have a coronal plane deformity, the deformity can be in the lower femur, the upper tibia, or ligamentous laxity, or any combination between them. Again, if you have a sagittal plane knee deformity, it might be a femoral plane deformity, tibial body deformity, or joint flexion contracture, or hyperextension laxity. You see, if you do weight bearing, standing view, and you see if you draw the joint orientation line of the lower femur and the joint orientation line of the upper tibia, you're going to make an angle. Usually the angle is zero, between zero and two, but this is a real angle. That means you have ligament dyslexia of the left side. Realignment of the knee joint deformity may be extra-articular or intra-articular can correct intra-articular or extra-articular. In this patient, you can do both. But in this patient, we did intra-articular correction, osteotomy through the physis, and we raised this segment, the tibial plateau. And in this example, this is an osteotomy, 
and correction and displacement, you see. You have to do displacement to correct the mechanical axis. So you can correct the rejoin deformity, intra-articular, like this patient, or extra-articular in such patient. So intra-articular knee deformities can, key, can be complete or, at, or partial. Complete is the whole articular surface is deformed, or just half of it is deformed. The whole is deformed, or just half of it is deformed. <clears throat> And you have to think if you have a complete or partial deformity of the joint. It's difficult to assess the intra-articular knee deformity. It's very difficult. Why? Because the joint orientation line. How to measure the joint orientation lines here is difficult. Some people use the joint orientation line from this point to that point. This is called the resolution line, but it's not accurate. Again, this is an example of the extra-articular correction. And you can manage at the same time here, the secondary deformities. You have bulgus, long-standing lung disease. You have bulgus of the lower femur, which had been treated by stably. You see, to have a normal mechanical axis. So you can do different modalities to correct the joint deformities. Don't be dogmatic. You can work with the physis. You can use guided growth. You can use permanent interleases, external fixator internal fixation. That's why we always talk about the principles, not about the tools, not about the hardware. Again, we have a varus knee and ligamentous laxity. This picture, patient 34 years old, unicompartmental osteoarthritis. We did osteotomy, high tibial osteotomy, do it below the tubal tubercle. We remove segment of the femur about three centimeters to tighten the lateral ligament and the gradual compression of the fibula gradual compression of the fibula and we have tightening of the knee you see he's standing one leg one leg you can use the physis to correct the knee deformities the flexion deformity by guided growth anteriorly again you have bulgus deformity tibia and femoral you can use the guided growth tibia and femoral intraarticular osteotomies lung disease and osteotome, displacement and corrective the axis and put a graft. Now we have incomplete or partial deformity of the articular surface of the lateral femoral condyle, such a patient. You have laxity also of the ligaments, medial ligamentous laxity. Again, we have a valgus deformity. We have to measure the mechanical axis of the femur and the tibia. And the analysis was we have a femoral intraarticular deformity, metaphysial deformity, shortening. Tibia, we have metaphysial deformity and shortening. Soft tissue have ligamentous laxity, coronal plane, because we have laxity in the coronal plane. We have soft tissue contracture because of the flexion knee in the sagittal plane. All these deformities in the same patient. And the osteotomies, the plan was we have to correct the intraarticular fragment. And this is the L shaped osteotomy for the intraarticular part. And the metaphysial part, another osteotomy, another osteotomy for the metaphysial tibial part. And this simulation done by my fellows, because usually I don't do drawings, but they always like that. So as you see, they did first osteotomy, and this is the L shaped osteotomy to push this segment down and to correct the low, the distal femur. And they will correct it, they pushed it medially and we have this is lengthening. This is done by the, my fellows, thanks to them. Anyhow, we did the first osteotomy L-shaped and with the distractor, we pushed it down. So this is acute correction of the deformity. Then you put olive wires of stitch wire reduce it. Then another osteotomy to correct the angular deformity and to do gradual lengthening. This is acute and gradual. See the picture immediately afterwards. Another osteotomy shape. 
Then gradual correction of the deformity and lengthening, gradual correction of the fuel deformity and lengthening. And the flexion contraction, we do the distraction from posterior to correct the, also had flexion of the distal femur, which had been corrected gradually. And this is the end picture. Fully corrected knee. So in conclusion, you have the choice to operate or not to operate according to the situation. Sometimes you have a desirable deformity and we create it. Progression of the deformity is very important. Ligament strikes, you have to deal with it during the correction. You can correct the problem intra or extra articular or both secondary deformities. Don't wait for the secondary deformities. If they develop, you have to correct them. Thank you. Thanks so much, Prof. Hosni, for this uh, wonderful talk. And it's all again about the principles. And don't be dogmatic and keep open for all options. Uh, we get to the final talk by Professor Ahmad Alam. And again, the monolateral choice in tibial long segment defects. OK. You have the share now? Yeah. yeah. OK, thank you. This is tibial long segment bone lengthening with the monolateral device. Again, to say that we are not a result of surgeons, we are reconstructive surgeons. As you know, the majority of long bone non-unions occur in the tibia. Association with infection, segmental bone loss, or shortening are responsible for substantial morbidity. When soft tissue, especially skin complications, are added to this problem due to multiple surgical procedures done to solve the first problem of non-union, this is one of the heaviest or the worst complications in our practice. These are particularly resistant to treatment and consequently many alternative approaches to elicit a solution have been suggested. The objectives is to evaluate prospectively the result of radical debridement, compression, and remote calotesis using monolateral or monoplane frames in infected non-united tibia with bone loss. This was conducted over 25 tibial non-united fractures aging from 8 to 65 years old. Infection was lasting with a mean of 3.8 years shortening from 4 to, 4 to 11 centimeters with skin or other soft tissue complications like muscle contracture, ankle, or knee stiffness. All patients have previous repeated surgeries ranging from two to five previous operations. The bridement was done for the non-union site with excision of bone ends till the healthy bone determined by the paprika sign, adding more shortening to the initial shortening or bone loss this was an average 4.2 centimeters, ranging from 2 to 7.5 centimeters more shortening. The extraction calotesis principle was performed at a proximal or distal corticotomy. Technique of debridement acute compression could be done in 68% of cases. In the remaining 32% of cases, the gap after debridement was very large, so bone transport was used. Primary skin closure was possible in all cases, except in only two cases where a release incision was needed. Fibular osteotomy was performed in 44% of cases. Different types of monoplane external fixators, Wagner, Hoffman, AO frame designs were applied. It was applied as a monoplane, monoaxial device in 28% of cases and in heavyweight patients or with with long segment transport, it was done monoplane, but by axial device in 72% of cases. Physical rehabilitation was done early and weight bearing was also according to the same principles as we said in the femoral bone lacing before. Clinical and radiological evaluation of non-union healing, eradication of infection, functional recovery of the limb after healing, reoperation rate and patient satisfactions 
were our evaluation criteria. Bone healing for the non-union site was achieved in 96% of cases in an average of 18 weeks. Infection was eradicated in 88%. All united cases have eradication of infection, but the remaining infected three fractures, only two of them showed bone, bone healing. Healing of soft tissue wounds, debridement, and corticotomy was in average 18 days. The mean length gained was 8.7 centimeters, which have a range from 6.5 to 15 centimeters with the initial shortening plus the added excision. Clinical and functional scoring were satisfactory in 88% of cases and unsatisfactory in 12% of cases. Complications were the sum of debridement and lengthening procedure and they were classified into major and minor. We have 32 minor complications and 21 major complications after a follow-up of two to seven years. The most common minor complication was pain tract infection followed with problem of alignment during lensing and soft tissue contractures. All were minor because all were resolved during lengthening. The major complications were major angulations in two cases and delayed union in 16 cases. The reoperation rate was 16%, which is mainly to soft tissue problems, not the technique itself. This is a review of literature about some other related complications and how much we are comparable to them. Some case presentation. This male, 53 years old, with open fracture, grade 3B of right leg in association with open fracture, femur, femur open pelvic fracture, all were treated with external fixation. He have extensive soft tissue loss, severe infection, repeated debridement, subsequently bone defect of nine centimeters. And this is X-ray four months post fracture the day we received him. This is monoplane, double frame or biaxial application, debridement and distal corticotomy. This is the photo for the patient with the frames on for the femur and tibia. This is 15 weeks later showing would regenerate distally and closure of the compression site proximally. This is two and a half years post operative appearance and x ray. Another case, he is a male, eight years old. We ha he has crushed leg, grade 3B open fracture. He has several operations external fixation, loosening, blade and graft, infection, loosening rush pin application, this one ending with heavy infection, non-union, 11 centimeters shortening from the fracture itself and the proximal tibial epiphyseal arrest, which is associated here. This X-ray is 22 months post trauma. This is monoplane double frame application after radical debridement and the proximal corticotomy. This is 10 months post operative. This is 22 months post operative over lengthening was intended to compensate for future lengthening. We added here hydroxyapatite granules for delayed union. This is limb equalization after four years. The apparent hump from the proximal tibial abophysis is not cumbersome for the patient and he didn't ask for any treatment for it. This is his functional range. And this is six years post-operative X-ray and the clinical appearance with full knee range. This is Banha University Hospitals and Faculty of Medicine, where we work here in Egypt. Another case, 20 years, 24 years old, with established non-union infection, 3.6 centimeter shortening in an already applied external fixator for the third time after repeated debridement. This is nine month post-trauma combined the interim dullary and extra dullary fixation and circulation. This is debridement, compression at the non-union site and distal corticotomy and lengthening. 
And this is two years post-operative appearance and function. Review of literature and other similar series treated by distraction osteogenesis, conventional bone grafting with or without impregnated antibiotics, or free vascularized bone grafting with or without soft tissue flap transfers in one or two stages compared with the results of the present, present series provided the following data, that fracture healing time, eradication of infection, the lengthened bone segment, the clinical and functional scoring results, all showed no significant difference as compared with the cases treated by other different techniques, including bone grafting. As regarding complications, in spite of the added rate of complication of lengthening to those of debridement, total encountered complication of this series showed significant decrease, also total minor complications and total major complications showed significant decrease in, as compared to other series. The reoperation rate also was significantly different and decreased. Fracture need for regrafting occurred in only one patient, which is 4%, which is in other series from 12 to 83% of cases. To summarize, most authors agree that it is essential to remove all nec necrotic and infective bone when treating osteomyelitis. Bone healing was significantly improved and correlated with debridement, which is considered a powerful encouraging factor for bone healing as compared to other techniques called bloodless technique. I prefer debridement technique. Infection was significantly eradicated with debridement than in cases with no debridement done. The monoplanar external fixator were preferred because they are simpler to apply, better tolerated by the patient than ring fixators, have fewer complication rates, especially pentract infection, which may lead to its loosening with associated bony infection or osteomyelitis. There were no refractures, loss of correction or length, reactivation of infection in the cleanly united fractures. This is another last case to finish. Who suffered the grade 3B open fracture of his right leg with another open fracture of the femur and forearm fracture head injury. However, for the leg, he has six previous operations, monoplane external fixator with acute shortening, six centimeters, Two repeated bone and soft tissue debridement, loosening of the frame occurred heavy infection. Lizar of frame was applied with debridement. However, radical sequestrectomy was done, adding another eight centimeters, giving us this appearance. This is a medial view of the patient in the Lizar of frame. This is a lateral view with a thin soft tissue bridge behind the bones and the bones about to perforate. This is the X-ray of the patient. We have a lot of problems here. Heavy infection, loose frame, 14 centimeters, tibial shortening, severe osteoporosis, bone ends adherent to the very thin skin about to perforate. We have also neglected mid-tarsal break, sodic atrophy, and abnormal anatomy inside the soft tissue envelope inside the bridge. And unfortunately, the patient refused completely to do any angiogram because he had a history of his father dying from idiosyncrasy for urography, and he refused to do angiogram. However, sometimes amputation seems to be logic in some cases like this, but the patient refused completely to have amputation. So we remove the frame, frequent dressing, supportive antibiotic. By five weeks, the fibrous tissue is now in our side, approximating the bone ends and making the soft tissue bridge thicker and stronger. On the right, the brie, on the left, after removal of the frame and waiting for five weeks. This is radical debridement, monoblane frame application and acute compression, this interoperative photo. This is soft tissue healing after four weeks. This is bone healing of the non-union site after 11 weeks. The matter of length equalization is easy to perform. 
after doing scanogram, proximal corticotomy, gradual lengthening. When length was achieved and union was achieved also, patient has good power in his limb, the easy, easy task is to correct the neglected tarsal break, which was left till the end to be sure that the patient will complete with no amputation. This is a patient after foot correction, and this is his active range after lengthening and union, and his foot corrected now and blunt degree. To conclude, debridement combined with mechanically competent monoplane external fixator can successfully produce bone union with a good quality callus, eradicate infection, correct shortening at an accepted complication rate. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Prof. Lam, for this uh, wonderful talk. Uh, it's again another proof that uh, all the tools are available. You should uh, do uh, what you can do properly and what's the best for the patient. So you can do the Zaruf, you can do the monitor fixator, whatever the tool, you apply the principle. Uh, there are some few questions. Um, if you don't mind, Prof. Alam, we can just give short answers, uh, just not to well, make some people our colleagues upset. <laughs> uh, I, I know it's beyond the midnight, but just uh, for yeah. our colleagues not to be uh, said that we didn't answer the questions. Uh, yeah. What about the loss of range of motion of the ankle or the knee during lengthening? How would you solve this problem? We usually start mobilizing the knee or the ankle early, or we can involve the calcaneus in the frame if we have a tibial frame, but usually early physiotherapy and the early mobilization is enough. Rarely we use mobilization under anesthesia early during lengthening, not late. But usually when you start physiotherapy early, it is corrected, no problem. As you see in all cases, no fixed knee or ankle deformity you have. So if, if you have a patient with a weak callus formation during the distraction, how would you treat this problem? We can it. Yeah, you can use the telescoping technique as occurring in ring fixators. You can shorten, wait for some time, re-lengthen, shorten, re in cycles till you have a good regenerate. That's what occurs in many cases. Um, a general question, how would you determine the site of osteotomy? I think this is for lengthening, generally. Again, I didn't hear you. Uh, determine the site of osteotomy. The best osteotomy is the cancellous site. So you try to be at the cancellous site as much as you can. Sub subcondral after the end of the three pins you have, either proximal or distal. You can have sometimes the epiphyseal osteotomy, but the union rates are different. So you cool. always choose the cancellous bone to osteotomize. Yeah. Uh, a question, uh, if there is a shortening with deformity, can you deal with this with monolateral? I think you showed some cases like this, that you can do whatever you like with, with the with All the cases monolateral. have deformity, I show. Yeah. Um, uh, how to, okay. Uh, how would you adjust the lengthening per day on the monolateral frame. Um, I think uh, the, the, our colleague might not be uh, familiar with the uh, DC device and the LRS. So he asked about how would you adjust the rate? These devices are designed to have one millimeter lens for the full turn. If you turn the handle 36, 360 degrees, you have one millimeter. You can divide it in three or four times per day. The full tear is one millimeter. Yeah. Um, two questions about the last case. How did you correct the foot? Or did you fuse it or what did you do with it? Yeah, I have a neglected tarsal fractures, which was mal united. It was tarsometatarsal fracture. So I removed the posterior wedge from the tarsus and the metatarsus, which was already fused in malposition. This is a simple posterior closing which. Yeah, uh, again, another case, another question about the last case. Uh, was there any room for the plastic surgeon to help? 
<coughs> Neuroplastic surgeon to do what? Um, like I think he, he suggests like a flap or so. After the bride meant a flap to cover. The first step was removing the distillation of the Elizarov to allow soft tissues to contract, as you saw in the photos. So this is number one. Number two, after you excise more bone, you have more soft tissues. You have no fear about neurovascular complications. You have relaxed soft tissue for five weeks or six weeks, as we did. And then you excise the necrotic dead bone. You have more shortening. You have more relaxation for the soft tissues. Uh, how would you avoid angular deformity during lengthening, especially with monolateral fixator? You can see procurvatum also, especially with the tibia. How would you avoid this or deal with it? The most common deformity you face during lengthening with monolateral frame is the varus deformity, whatever you are lengthening femoral or tibial. When you use monoaxial double frame, this is abolished. When you are using monolateral monoaxial frame, it occurs sometimes. But usually a little degrees, you just do in the outpatient clinic some loosening of the frame and readjustment of the deformity because you have still a weak or uh, early forming callus or degenerate, which is very soft. Just some loosening of the frame and manual correction and retightening of the frame of the clamps again. Okay, uh, uh, that's not for questions. Uh, a question about the muscular technique. I think you had a, a dedicated talk for this. So just uh, our uh, dear colleague, Leith, uh, just follow yeah. the program and there will be a talk about it. Hexaboot struts in Egypt, they are available, but they are um, um, expensive a bit. So expensive. yeah. thanks so much for this uh, wonderful day. And uh, Prof. Lash have to uh, close the day, please. Thank you, Dr. Ahmed. And now we come to the end of the third day of uh, deformity correction and faulting planning uh, course and LRS course. Uh, many thanks to uh, our international and national guest speakers and uh, to the uh, Prof. Ahmed Alam, Prof. Gamal Hosni, Prof. Ahmed Sheikh, and all our colleagues. Uh, tomorrow uh, will be a special uh, guest uh, from uh, USA with the uh, UK guests and uh, our Egyptian colleagues. Uh, tomorrow is a special night, very fruitful night, which is the fourth day in Banha LRS online review course. Uh, see you tomorrow at 10 p.m. inshallah, and good night. Many thanks to all of you. Thank you, all of you. Have a good night.